All right. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to And I am on the board of the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania. I'm also the assistant director of the Civil War Institute at Gettysburg College. And tonight I am joined by not just one, uh, but two actually esteemed Lincoln scholars. So this is a real treat to have both of them join in with both of us, uh, with all of us tonight. Um, and I will say too that probably there needs no introduction for either of these folks, especially for those of you who are members of the fellowship or members of the forum. You're probably very familiar uh, with both of them, but I def definitely would like to introduce uh, our guests, Harold Holzer and Wendy Allen to everyone tonight um, and acquaint you a little bit uh, with their work. So our first guest is, of course, Harold Holzer. He is a leading Lincoln scholar of our age. In fact, one of the leading Lincoln scholars ever um, in American history. Um, he has written prolifically about Abraham Lincoln. He's written 54 books, written or co-written or edited uh, 54 books about Abraham Lincoln, hundreds and hundreds of articles and book reviews about Lincoln. He is an active public speaker as well, so he doesn't just kind of hole up in his office, but he actively shares his knowledge uh, with the general public, which is one of his great gifts. And he does a tremendous amount of service work um, in doing so as well. His professional affiliation um, is that he's the Jonathan F. Fanton Director of Hunter College, um, College's Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, so he's based out of New York City. Um, but as I said, he's done a wide range of public service, um, educational outreach, um, just, just very active in the field. So I'm sure many of you have, have seen him either on TV as a talking head, on radio discussing Lincoln or, or uh, issues related to Lincoln and, and leadership um, and other issues. Um, Harold was also, he served on the, let me see if I can get this right, it was the Lincoln Bicentennial Foundation that you were the chairman of, is that correct? Mm -hmm. and, and, the, was, and the commission, yeah. Yes, and the co-chair of the U.S. Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. So um, definitely did a lot of work very recently uh, with the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial. He is also the 2008 recipient of the National Humanities Council uh, Medal, which is quite distinguished as well. Um, Harold Holzer was also the recipient of the very prestigious Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize back in, remind me, Harold, 2015? Yes. 2015 for his book, uh, Lincoln and the Press, uh, the, Lincoln and the Power of the Press, excuse me, The War for Popular Opinion, which is an excellent read. Um, so definitely there are many, many ways that you can get involved with Harold's scholarship. Um, obviously, one of the books that we'll be talking about tonight with the topic of our conversation is The Lincoln Image, Abraham Lincoln in the Popular Print, which was a volume that was co-edited with Gabor Borat and Mark Neely. Um, but you can find his books just about uh, anywhere these days. So, Harold, it's a real treat to be able to close this series of the year with you tonight. And you. I'm also you. joined this evening by a friend and colleague, uh, Wendy Allen, who is a local Gettysburg resident, but she is a nationally and internationally acclaimed uh, Lincoln artist. She has studied Lincoln for many, many years. She has painted, how many paintings do you think you've done of Lincoln by this point, Wendy? 500 maybe. Oh my goodness, 500. And you can see some of the works in progress there behind her uh, right. in her studio. I love my studio. Yes. I come up in the winter time. I move everything up into the studio and get work done. Yes. Yes. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, Wendy uh, comes to the study of Lincoln and Lincoln paintings actually from a background um, in publishing, on uh, educational publishing. And then she switched over in 2007, correct, uh, to really painting full time. Uh, she fell in love with painting Lincoln a long time ago, back in the 1980s, I think it was. And from That's there, years. Yeah. From there, you could say uh, the rest is is history. Um, so Lincoln is definitely uh, definitely big in, in Wendy's life, and we're all the better for it. Um, I also want to say just a personal word about Wendy. 
Wendy has served faithfully on numerous boards within the town of Gettysburg for many, many years. Main Street Gettysburg, the revitalization project that's ongoing, the Lincoln Forum, she's on the board of the Lincoln Forum. And for many, many years, she served faithfully with the Lincoln Fellowship of Pennsylvania, which is where I really got to know her. She has just recently moved on from the board, which we are all deeply sad about. Um, but I just wanted to acknowledge her, her service to the Lincoln Fellowship, since this is a fellowship sponsored event. Uh, she has worked tirelessly on the dedication day ceremonies that we hold every year in the National Cemetery every November 19th. She also was the founder of what has now become a very popular summertime program, our 100 Nights of Taps program, uh, which runs for 100 nights, sometimes more, uh, which was the case this past summer, uh, in the National Cemetery, playing taps at 7 p.m. every evening uh, with a special small ceremony to accompany it. It's a tremendous amount of work, and Wendy has dedicated her heart and soul to the fellowship, to the board, to all of these, these things that we've done, uh, and we're tremendously grateful to her for that. So, as I said, many of you watching tonight have probably met both Wendy and Harold at the Lincoln Forum, at the Lincoln Fellowship. Um, so yes, they don't really need any introduction, both for uh, what they've done for the field, but also where you've seen them out in the general public uh, serving and educating as well. But thank you guys so much, Harold and, and Wendy, for joining uh, this evening. Thank you. So the topic of tonight's conversation, as you all know from our advertisements, um, is the Lincoln image in American print and popular culture. We're kind of gonna take a, a wide angle, um, kind of high perspective uh, look at the Lincoln image tonight. We're going to be talking, of course, about the origins of the Lincoln image, talking about what exactly we mean when we say the Lincoln image, um, talking about images that were produced in the 1860s. Um, but then we're also going to be talking about more modern interpretations of Lincoln. Uh, and especially we want to rely on Wendy's expertise for um, how perspectives of Lincoln and, and depicting Lincoln in print and in painting have changed over the years. So Harold, I was wondering if you could just get us started by throwing us back to the 1860s, mid 19th century. And if you could kind of orient us as to what were the elements that kind of formed the confluence for the first explosion of Lincoln prints and Lincoln images that came to the fore uh, around 1860? What elements in society, in politics, in art and publication, um, what really helped to come together to produce this first major wave of Lincoln prints, which really then took off uh, in several different waves as you've identified in your scholarship? Um, I will answer, but first, Ashley, I want to thank you for the entire series you've done and um, for asking me to shut it down tonight. I um, hope it's okay that we're doing that. And um, um, also, we're so glad to be in Gettysburg a few weeks ago um, for the Lincoln Forum and, and the uh, fellowship lunch and the cemetery um, um, dedication day that Wendy organizes so beautifully. It was quite quite a week. And I'm glad it was sort of in a moment um, when we felt safe. It may be temporary, it may be a huge paradise. Is my voice okay? Because I'm hearing a lot of echo, but you're okay? Yeah. Okay, I'll live with you. Okay. So, as and thank you also for celebrating a, a book that's almost 40 years old. You've succeeded in making me feel ancient, but I'll I'll Thanks. deal with that. <laughs> 1984, and of, as you mentioned, co-authored with local Lincoln legend Gabor Borat, um, and and our mutual friend Mark Neely. So it was quite a three-city effort in the days I will add before email, before Zoom, um, really at the dawn of the age of computers for typesetting. So it was a really Talk about being at the right moment. Anyway, to get back to your really good question, setting. Hey, Harold, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. We are getting people saying that they're hearing echo now, and I'm hearing every now and then I'm hearing something. Yeah. I'm not sure if your volume is up too high or what that might the be. The problem is I don't know how to deal with it. But right now, that was Maybe fine. I should just lower my microphone. How about that? Because I'm using a mic. Is that better? Yeah, I think it is. Sounds good for right now, okay. yeah. Apologies. Um, Tech stuff isn't my thing. So in 1860, whoops. 
1860, we were at a moment. Let's see, what else can I do here to help? I may turn off my iPhone. Sorry about all this, That's okay. even though it's not tuned to this. Um, a moment when, as you say, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln's rise and the development of, of uh, reproductions, technology for visual reproductions, kind of met. Um, lithograph, which had been introduced in Europe in the 1830s, really started proliferating here. I'm going to keep playing to see if I can improve conditions here. Um, um, and um, they were inexpensive. So with the rise of a new politician like Lincoln, there was an intense curiosity to see what he looked like. And the reason the demand was high is that we had in Lincoln a person who was really the first, well, maybe not the first, but the quintessential dark horse nominee for the presidency. Who is Abraham Lincoln? Uh, what are these stories about um, uh, rail splitting and boat uh, shepherding? Um, and um, the visual media was there to respond in all sorts of ways. And as we said, I think in our first chapter, it was the introduction of what we what was um, called in the, in the day a rail old Western gentleman. Harold, do you think you'd be able to turn down your volume at all? Would that help? Yeah, if I knew how, I would be happy to turn down my volume. Maybe I should just speak in a softer way. No one's ever accused me of speaking in a loud voice. <laughs> but I don't see the way to do it. Do you have um, something on your keyboard with um, the volume buttons? No, not on this mm -hmm. system. Maybe I'll just talk less. How about that? <laughs> no. Anyway, that's that's the conditions. And also keep in mind that images were precious to people in in 1860. They weren't as clearly as promiscuous as they are now. Um, I, I mean that in terms of volume. Um, in the I used to say when I lectured on this in the 80s, in the days before magazines um, and television, but obviously now we can add in the days before the internet and the proliferation of images, the political images kind of supplanted religious icons in the American consciousness. So Lincoln became almost a revered figure on the family parlor wall. Sure. Go ahead, I'm just tinkering here with more possibilities. So one of the things that you mentioned in your, um, in kind of the introductory part of your book is um, the nature of politics back in the 19th century and how um, politics were very public, how everybody knew your um, political affiliation, right. that people rarely switched over, it was very partisan. Um, and that one of the ways to show your, your political pride was to buy these prints and how awkward it might seem to us today to have prints of, you know, Barack Obama hanging on the wall, you know, of his family or of, you know, Joe Biden out, you know, gardening or something like that from a, you know, a previous time in his life or even a, a campaign image of, of Joe Biden or George Bush or somebody like that. But you stress that that was a common element in people's lives, that they had these in their parlors and that they were accessible enough financially where people, common people, could purchase these items. Right. When you think about it, an engraving of Lincoln might cost a dollar or two in 1860, but a, a lithograph cost 10 cents. So they were affordable. They were also given out by political parties. Um, you know, that was a way of campaigning in the days before rallies and uh, television commercials. Sure. Um, so, yes, and, um, the other thing about the political culture you point out that's important is mass participation, 80% turnout in 1860, a disputed election, I might add, um, that caused uh, um, uh, a, a bit of an insurrection called the Civil War, or at least led to, let's say, not caused. Um, but yes, it, um, in the era of torchlight parades and um, um, stemwinder speeches that uh, people attended, um, uh, 
you know, I always talk about the Cooper Union address as being emblematic of that kind of tolerance for uh, for long form politics. After after Lincoln delivered his ninety minute address, there were more speeches. Um, the local sheriff spoke. Uh, other people spoke because if you're paying twenty five cents to hear a lecturer like Abraham Lincoln, you need to get your money's worth. And you know, there's no TV or radio or or um, um, internet or uh, you know email at home. So you wanted to get your full money's worth. And that's what politics provided. It was entertainment, sports, and democracy all related to one thing. And pictures were part of that. Sure, sure. And you're mentioning a lot of things that um, uh, different types or different mediums um, of images. So lithographs, um, you mentioned in your book, carte de, de physite. Um, you mention, um, of course, daguerreotypes and ambrotypes, which were a different kind of photograph. Um, I'm wondering if, if maybe you could just kind of briefly outline for us what, what the difference is and why certain mediums became so much more prolific during this time period uh, than others. Sure. Well, there are also, um, and I'm texting my tech advisor here to see if he can help. So this is like, <coughs> talk about democracy in action. This is uh, webcam in action. Um, well, part of the difference in the images is part of it is form and part of it is uh, time. Um, in form, there was always sculpture and paintings, so, you know, back to the cave paintings. Um, but they were single items. They were not reproduced. Daguerreotypes were single images, expensively made, put in leather, leather or thermoplastic cases, meant to adorn a mantelpiece, but as the one precious image like the first photograph of Lincoln made in 1846 and the companion image made of Mary. Um, amber types were also same images. You know, daguerreotypes, 1840s, early 1840s. Amber types, early 1850s. Tin types were kind of a cheaper version. Ambrose are on glass. Tin types are on tin, really far, um, uh, kind of a metal. And by eight, in 1861, um, a Frenchman, who, a Frenchman also invented the daguerreotype, but this time a Frenchman invented the multi-lens camera that could take four images at once. And uh, photographers then became merchants. They cut the four images into small ones, put them on cardboard, not only sold them for family albums, but also <coughs> mass sold them at newsstands and uh, stationery dealers and political clubs. People bought big leather family albums and uh, and um, uh, kept, what's, I'll tell you one remarkable thing, not to digress too much. And I think someone is working on the sound now, which might improve matters. Maybe it already did. No, not quite. But um, I found many an album in my day, you know, when I was actively collecting Lincoln material and Photographica family albums that had not been touched or altered in more than a century. When you open them, it doesn't start with the picture of the grandfather or the grandmother. It starts with the many started with a photograph of Lincoln. And then you might see a photograph of, uh, of Ulysses Grant and uh, William Seward. And, and then maybe finally go to family images. Uh, the Lincolns had a family album filled with celebrities of the day. And to my astonishment, when I researched on this topic, their album not only had Stephen Douglas, it had John Wilkes Booth. I wonder what member of the family collected that image. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. I know that you have a, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something? No, no. Okay. It's Maybe probably it was just the echo. The echo, yes. <laughs> Um, I know that you had a whole bunch of images that you wanted to run through that maybe can help us kind of unpack what we mean when we talk about the Lincoln image and the rise and evolution of the image. So I'd like to bring up some of those images right now um, and have you kind of walk us through the evolution sure. of how he was portrayed. And also if you could help us understand why they're portraying him in certain ways and, and why that changes um, over, over the course of the war years. Let me just pull it up real quick. Uh, 
All righty. <clears throat> this is the perfect one to start with because it's the first known um, mass-produced image that's not a photograph, but a print uh, copied from uh, a rather famous 1857 uh, photo of Lincoln made in Chicago. And this image was actually one of hundreds and hundreds that were tossed from the balconies of the Wigwam in Chicago at the very moment Lincoln went over the top in the quest for the Republican nomination. So this is not only um, the first, it's probably the rarest Lincoln print. And um, I must say, I this was a copy that I owned. In fact, when we went online, this is the one we found. So when I when I disposed of my collection, I hope someone who loved this bought it. But here it is online. Um, it's a little bluer than the reproduction suggests. Um, but you know, I I can't see. I can see why very few survive because all the delegates are jumping up and down, and they're crushing these beneath their feet, and they're very thin. I'm very thin. But uh, typical introducing him as a Westerner with, with um, you know, hair all over the place, but sitting now under the emblem of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And is this, this is an image that is supposed to appeal to the common man, correct? Uh, uh, you know, this is an image of a, a statesman who's obviously a, a dark horse, but he's maybe more of of one of us than of maybe the the politicians that they're used to, to seeing, um, which was part of the campaign, correct? Yeah, uh, definitely. But again, you know, this is just made by his supporters on the run really yeah. quickly. Uh, I guess they had enormous confidence that he was going to prevail because they invested in this uh, little production, yeah. uh, determined to make it part of the uh, uh, of the celebration that they thought was inevitable. And yeah, you're right. I'm not sure, if, you know, accidental. What do those words say down there? I can't even see. States. Oh, it says, it's interesting. I think it says state sovereignty on the bottom. Yeah. Which indicates to me that this design was used for something else first. Mm -hmm. Maybe Henry Clay. I don't know. But we've never been able to find the antecedents of this print. We were just lucky that when we did the book, we found the print. Right. In my living room, admittedly, but we found it. Yeah, that's amazing. Harold, it looks like his hair is a little cleaned up in this one too, even though it doesn't look cleaned up. But it looks like more, like it's a little more cleaned up than the original. They definitely, um, not only they improved it, uh, and also flipped it so he's facing the. Other I was going to say, he looks like a photograph is a gem. Yeah. Allegedly, the photographer Alexander Hessler didn't like Lincoln's smooth down hair, so okay. just before he took the picture, he ran his fingers through his hair, oh. which would have very little effect on me. Although <laughs> once upon a time, I had wild hair too. Well, and you're so speaking to that. First. And then Lincoln is, you know, then suddenly he's the candidate and all of the New, this, all of the New York printmakers get into the act. They realize that he's going to be the saleable man. So if you look at the next image, mm -hmm. um, that uh, yeah, that's it. This is modeled after the Cooper Union photograph, so-called. And here, Carter and Ives add a bit of color um, and uh, introduce him as honorable Abraham Lincoln Republican candidate for the presidency. Um, this was a huge bestseller, although the records don't exist um, for Carter and Ives. Um, the amount, the number that has survived, indicates how popular it once was. Uh, generations preserved and kept them. So here's one that really introduced Lincoln in the East. But one thing about Courier and Ives and other firms that people should know. These prints came from the bottom up, not the top down. The Republican Party didn't commission them at this point. They are made in response to what is perceived to be popular demand. Um, but Courier and Ives had no um, no stake in the race. They had no horse in the race to get the metaphor straight. So if you look at the next picture, um, they're also capable of putting out this 
a, a cartoon that was racist even in its day. Yeah. I kind of debated on whether to show this, but um, this would have had a lot of meaning for New Yorkers because that um, the figure in the middle was uh, exhibited at Barnum Museum. He was a um, you know a um, disabled African American, and he was passed off as a half human, half not human by Barnum, who was kind of a monster in the way he mounted shows. And this, this the central figure was a famous image in its own right in 1859. So here we have Lincoln leaning on a rail, uh, you know, one of his log rails, uh, and conspiring with Horace Greeley, the anti-slavery editor of the New York Tribune, and what those word boxes say is, well, once I'm elected, here is the next Republican candidate trying to say in a really monstrous way that, um, you know, we're going to turn over the party not only to African-Americans, but to those who are clearly unable to make their own way, much less uh, govern others, um, the next Republican candidate. But that's what Curry and I were doing, playing both sides. And when these cartoons are made, are they, are they being... Are they basing their images of Lincoln upon actual photographs, or are these more so kind of the sketches and caricatures that you would think of for a cartoonist? No, that that fellow there is the same as the first image. Yeah, it's that wigwam, a wigwam edition with a with the messed up hair, mm -hmm. kind of not not copied too well, but and you know that's not Lincoln's body there, as Wendy, as you can see Wendy's image there on over her right shoulder. Um, yeah. But you know, they're guessing, they're still guessing at this point. Yeah. So then the New York, the fancy New Yorkers say, wait a minute, we don't really know what Lincoln looks like. Let's send an artist out to Springfield. Mm -hmm. But nobody really wants to go. But they get a young guy named Thomas Hicks. And he goes out and paints Abraham Lincoln. And this is the first painting from life of Lincoln that we all universally accept. And I will add that the artist had a lot of problems making Lincoln sit still. He was a busy guy in June 1860, um, receiving a lot of visitors at the State House. So he took Lincoln down. Uh, he had a photographer come. And uh, it was actually the same photographer who took that messed up hair picture and posed Lincoln in front of the State House uh, windows and got some of the greatest photographs ever made of Lincoln. I didn't include that here. But then he modeled it. And then if you go to the next slide, you see the result is a lithograph for the masses based on that painting. And that's just sort of a very quick snapshot of the pre-presidential Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there were dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of campaign images, anti, pro, um, accurate, crazy, um, but people of all financial means got got their look at him. Right. Yeah, you had a, a great quote in your book. I'm trying to find it. Um, that that oftentimes these prints, these images could be, quote, revealing without being truthful, which I think is such a, a great way to describe them. They reveal so much about people's either perceptions of Lincoln or, or how they wanted other people to perceive Lincoln, but not necessarily how right. he actually looked. And so many times as you talk about, they would change the nature of his smile. He'd be smiling a little more. They'd kind of lighten up under his eyes or, you know, as you, you mentioned, either slick back the hair or make it look a little bit messier according to what audience they're trying to reach and, and for whatever reasons. Uh, but just the the craftsmanship and the, the artistic license that's involved in so many of these images is I think so important for people to remember. Well, Lincoln definitely liked this look. He said to the artist, it has a somewhat pleasanter expression than I normally have, but right. that is not an objection. Right, right. He liked to joke with artists. Right. And of course, so many people viewed him as being, you know, completely ugly. And he would admit it himself that he was not an attractive individual. And um, these prints sought to make the best out of that situation or play it to his political um, good fortune, exactly. um, but definitely softening up some of those more hideous 
aspects of his of his uh, appearance. Um, I mean, it's hard. It really is hard for us to understand today what people thought was so homely about him because you know, in repose, he's a pretty terrific looking person. But as you say, Ashley, they smoothed out his complexion, which was, you know, uh, people who saw him said he had a face that was indented as if it had been scarred by acid, by vitriol. So he clearly had the remnants of, I guess, you know, childhood acne or something. And he also had a lot more moles than the famous mole. So we don't see that. And even ph photographs managed to use lights or deflection of light to get that uh, out. And, you know, in repose, he was okay. It's when he started moving his face around that he became a little grotesque. And we don't see that, sadly, because there were no motion pictures. And Wendy, did you say that, and Harold, I'm sure you know, too, um, I think, Wendy, you told me that he had a lazy eye or something like a lazy eye. Is that right? Got the floating, what is it? I think it's the left eye. Um, and Harold, I just know, I know for the story from being maybe kicked as a kid by a, hmm. in a grist mill, uh, knocked unconscious and, and perhaps causing that. Um, maybe you know for sure, but he, when I paint him, it's always, if you don't do that, you don't get his face right at all. Um, his, one, his one eye is much higher than the other. Yeah. You know, it's a weird thing. No one knows. I mean, the people who advocate that he had Marfan syndrome use that. Uh, when a lens gets loose in the eye, that's one of the symptoms of Marfan's, which I don't believe. I think it was the, the horse kick or the mule kick that, that did it. But it also distorted his entire face. I mean, I always uh, tell kids when they're looking at Lincoln images, if you cover one side of Lincoln's face, he seems to be smiling, and then the other side seems to be frowning. Exactly. That's a little bit of distortion of the face. Definitely. Which you capture, Wendy, in your pictures. Well, no, it's just so, if you don't do that, you don't get it. You know, it's like, so his lips are really strange. Yeah. And if you yeah. don't get that right either, um, it's, it's off. Yeah. Yeah. So Harold, that's kind of the, the first burst of Lincoln imagery that we see. And then it's not necessarily quiet until the emancipation um, images. No, there's one like more, there's one significant interlude and that is Lincoln really gave an opportunity to the image makers when he grew a beard. He's the first presidential candidate to change his appearance. That's right. Between his election and his inauguration. Right. So I'll, I'll show you one example. If you look at the next image, that's a print called Union. It was issued in 1850 to mark the compromise of 1850. And the central figures are Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, Seaton, and uh, I'm sorry, that's Lewis Cass, then Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, Webster is to the all right of the bust of Washington. Imagine John C. Calhoun is being celebrated. So if you quickly go to the next one, um, here's Lincoln being imposed on that scene, all of it being brought up to date, except uh, Clay and Webster seem to be there without reasonable explanation. And imagine this with a beard added. Um, uh, and I'll show you why in the next image. And this is a terrible copy. I'm sad to say I own one of these too. Um, I'm getting very nostalgic for my my collection now. This is the National Republican chart issued by an engraver named H.H. H. Lloyd. I like any H.H., H., so I always feature him. And um, this is the poster, maybe not this copy, that Grace Bedell, the little girl in Westfield, New York, saw, inspiring her to write her famous letter to Lincoln, suggesting he'd look better if he grew a beard. And of course, as we know, grow a beard, he did. And I'll show you how Courier and Ives responded. If you the an election pre-election print, if you go to the next one, not too accurate. <laughs> but they're trying. So that's where things rested in the Lincoln image. When you think about 1861, the celebrity prints in, in early 62 
the people who were portrayed most often were Elmer Ellsworth, mm -hmm. the first Union officer killed, uh, and George McClellan. Right. Lots of prints of them. Major Anderson to a lesser degree. Images of Lincoln with those early generals. And that's where things rested until late 62, early 63 with the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah. Harold, regarding the beard, I think in your book, the Lincoln image, you mentioned that the Republican people in the Republican Party urged him to grow a beard. Is yeah, there were more letters. There were more letters than graces, to be sure. Someone told him to get better collars, too. Um, you know, oh, co oh collars, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, when Lincoln's inaugural train passed through Westfield, New York, he called out for the little girl. He remembered that someone from the town had written to him. He called her Grace Barley, but they all knew who it was. They sort of passed her forward. And as the newspapers said, he smothered her face with kisses. This was obviously 1860, not 2020. So you could do that. And she was so embarrassed, she fled and hid under her parents' wagon. Her house still stands, by the way, in Westfield. I've seen it. And she finally came out, and then she talked about the event for the next 75 years. She was a, a job too, didn't she? she eventually, was a active speaker through the 1930s. Wow, wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that part of the story. Huh. So then, this next shift to the the Emancipation Era prints. Um, what is it about those prints that changes the way that um, printmakers, photographers, painters are portraying Lincoln? And again, I'm going to focus on prints, but it's as if they heard Lincoln on the day that he signed it, January 1st, saying, if my name ever goes into history, it will be because of this act. It was immediately recognized as transformative and worthy of celebration or condemnation visually. So if you look at this first print, which is also not PC, it, it, it visualizes an emancipation moment, which didn't really occur because Union troops and African-Americans themselves had to make the dream into a reality or make the promise fulfillable. But this is an old image in classical art the, the, the freedom giver raises his hand and the chains on the ground, the chains, the shackles break. And here we have a, you know, a supplicant father thanking Lincoln for granting him immediate liberty. We know that if such a fellow existed, he probably enlisted and, you know, might have been killed fighting for his freedom and the freedom of his family, if his family had not been ripped apart by the slave power in the first place. But if you look at this next print, there were opponents, and this is a subtle print, but it was understood in its time. It's called Writing the Emancipation Proclamation. It shows Lincoln in a rather slovenly manner. Uh, um, the, there is the scales of justice, as you see, are tipped um, away from equal justice. Um, it, it, it's a very peculiar print, but it's not a flattering one. And there, uh, there are worse ones. Uh, Adelbert Volk uh, did one that showed him using an inkwell being held by Satan. But if you look at the next one, this is the quintessential emancipation print. Uh, this is the painting. Uh, uh, by Francis Carpenter, which he did. I hate to say he painted from life because Wendy gets envious, but he spent six months working on this picture, although I don't believe he lived in the White House, as the legend says, but he worked there every day. Um, and this is a very simple kind of scene. It's Lincoln reading the first proclamation to his cabinet. The left-wingers who want emancipation immediately on the left, the middle of the rotors, um, Wells and Seward in the middle and the conservatives on the right, um, a map of the slave 
states on the right that Lincoln actually used. Um, he liked to send Union troops where the, they were the most enslaved people. Um, and if you look at the next image, this is the print that it inspired, the best-selling Lincoln print, I believe, of all time. They were still issuing these in the 1890s. But as Carpenter said, and it doesn't seem like it, he said he wanted to portray a moment almost divine. Hmm. Hmm. To us, it looks like a group of old white men hanging out, but right. people got it immediately. This was a transformative moment. Right. That painting is one that Carpenter had a hard time deciding when to stop working on it. Almost yeah, look, at, look at the Lincoln image here. It's, you're absolutely right, Wendy. Go back one and you'll see what he did to the face. Hmm. Overpainted, don't you think? Yeah, I think he even brought it back from even a darker, almost wiping it out completely. The people told him he had ruined the painting, I think, the face, and started painting it back, from what I recall, to what yeah. it, that. He took, it was toured throughout the country on a, you know, it's like, um, what is the, the dimensions like nine feet by six feet? It's a big thing. And he toured it on a collapsible frame. And when they opened it at different destinations, it required some repair work in the seams. And then he was ready to donate it to Congress, but not donate it. It was, he got $24,000 for it, but he had a patron. Um, and um, he went over it one more time. And today it's it's in the stairway to the Senate gallery. Huh. I saw it again. The last time I saw it was the, I went to one of the impeachment hearings on the Senate floor. Uh, so I got, I just spent a lot of time looking at the picture again. Well, huh. isn't it significant too that it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's put in a natural surrounding. I mean, art was starting to change a little bit in terms of creating more uh, natural organic look, like, much like Vinnie Reams, a statue in the in the rotunda with his normal clothing. Um, is that? I think you're absolutely right. And sculpture was changing, but Carpenter says in his um, memoirs and letters, I did not want this to be ruined by allegorical, um, you know, flaws. And um, it has to be again when a moment a simple man is elevated to a divine status, and. Uh, he didn't want any symbolism. I mean, he has some subtle things. Again, that open book is William Whiting's um, book. He was the Solicitor General on the war powers of the president. Um, there, there, there's uh, the painting of Jackson has sort of been obscured. So they didn't want to, didn't think it was right to put a Democrat in there. There's that slave map uh, on on the right, and. Um, a painting of a, a one member of the cabinet who had passed away on the left. And the grouping is symbolic. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, the one thing artists couldn't seem to help doing is using a feathered quill. It drives me crazy. I know, right? You no, know Lincoln didn't use feathered quills. <laughs> but, but I guess perspective get what isn't great, as you see. Every time I see that, I can't tell not. I just think people, you know, uh, Carpenter put it on exhibit in the East Room, and Lincoln said, um, it is as good as it can be made. The portraiture is absolutely flawless. I think just people love the fact that he got them. And Wendy, I don't know, in your many trips to the um, Lincoln Prize dinners or occasional trips, the Union League Club owns the models for all of these uh, pictures, all of the cabinet members, and they are sensational. Wow. Fresh, beautiful, except for the Lincoln one, which is overpainted and over <laughs> Wow. Interesting. Do you have more in the emancipation era, Harold? Or do That's you it for emancipation. Yeah. We go right to martyrdom, and then I want to hear Wendy talk without yeah. an echo. I'm dying to hear her. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you say just real quick before we move on to the martyrdom image is you can definitely see the clear changeover into the allegorical, heavily symbolic <laughs> imagery just from this one. It, it's so dramatic. Um, yeah. And of course, 
there's the news value of the assassination. Right. This print was copyrighted, I think, on April 25th. And 11, getting a print like this out in 11 days was considered miraculous in those days. And of course, this is not an accurate tableau. You know, there's no depth within the presidential box. Lincoln wasn't clutching a flag. Um, he was actually holding Mary's hand. But it's got all the elements. It's got Rathbone, you know, starting his charge at Booth. It's got the dagger in Booth's hand that he would stab Rathbone with. And it was a huge bestseller. And then Courier and Ives followed it with a, at least four of the deathbed scenes, one of which is next. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, Mary technically was not in the room when Lincoln died. Right. Tad was certainly nowhere on the scene. Um, I'm not sure Laura King, the actress in the background, made it to that point either. Um, people love these, and there are some that show 80 eyewitnesses and expand the, the room to accommodate everyone who visited that night. Right. I'm sure Mary would have hated this because she didn't like Andrew Johnson very much and would have objected to his being included. But in the, in the very last phase of his image, before more recent artists, you know, from, you know, Gabor Board and I did a, uh, a chapter in a book called The Lincoln Enigma on Lincoln and Modern Art, by which we mean modern everything, you know, from, from N.C. Wyeth to Wendy Allen. But if you look at the next image, this is where the Lincoln image left off. Yeah. Lincoln um, as an icon, the apotheosis, Lincoln rising to heaven with faith, hope, and charity in the heavens. Then, of course, George Washington welcoming him uh, to this sort of um, um, political, secular afterworld. Right. Uh, Lincoln being crowned with a laurel. So it's an afterworld that only they occupied. Um, and even though we question them a little more closely today, reputationally, there is absolutely no question that there was a huge market in that period for absolute canonizations of Lincoln. And it, it came, the image came full cycle. The political image replaced the religious image of Lincoln, the religious icons on the walls, and eventually the image of Lincoln as an icon replaced the political image. Right. Right. Yeah, that that merging of politics and religion and the artwork is fascinating. And, you know, even as as some of those images of um, the actual assassination is surprising as they might be, they, of course, as you state, are, you know, very much sanitized. They don't show the blood. They don't show the full extent of the horror. Um, so there is still that masking of the actual depth of, of the horrific reality from the yeah. public at, in the same time as they're trying to convey this horrific but historic moment uh, to the public. It's interesting um, that they're only willing to show so much. And the fact that, as you said, people would have these images on their walls, you know, people people would buy an image of the assassination, which seems bizarre again to us, but for 19th century politics, that that wouldn't seem odd at all. Right. Um, and then, I, you know, you're you're part of your your book where you talk about all of the images of the Lincoln family that would come out afterwards too, after Lincoln's death, and images where there would be staged. You'd have Willie and you'd have Tad and you've had Robert all in the same room around the same table. And as you well state, mm -hmm. how many times in Lincoln's presidency did they actually all sit down around the same table? Very few times. They just wouldn't have right. had the time to. Of course, Willie dies early in the war. Um, but there's a, a clamoring for that because of the importance of family and the centrality of family to 19th century Victorian exactly. ideals. And yeah. I think people wanted assurance, however, um, overstated that Lincoln had enjoyed uh, the respite of a loving family right. uh, to give him precious moments away from the hard work of winning the war. Right. Well, I'm sure he did, but as you say, I don't know when they ever all got together. Maybe late 1861 was, yeah. or, you know, summer of 61 when yeah. Robert came home from college. Yeah. And, before and it's, not like, it's not like we have a plethora of images of, Mary and Abraham, or you know, even Lincoln and his sons, we have those couple of, of him and Tad, but it's not like there are just a ton of them 
being together. Um, no, right. no photographs, not a ton no, of photographs. Just, just Taddy, and but as you can see over <laughs> Wendy's left shoulder, that's going to change soon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wendy, could you transition us then to more modern interpretations of Lincoln? How does it how does it make this dramatic shift of the the martyrdom days immediately after um, the assassination of Lincoln into so many different images that we see today? And your style is so unique because you can paint some very somber, reflective portrayals of Lincoln. And on the other hand, you have some much more modernist. Um, or almost postmodernist, I, I would say, in some instances, portrayals of him. So how how do we make that that leap? You know, I, to be honest, Ashley, I'm not sure I can even talk to that. Harold, we'd be much better talking to that than I am. Um, I can talk. I I brought some of my pieces, um, yeah. uh, and I know that I, for me, painting Lincoln became sort of a well, what Elaine de Kooning, to paraphrase her, was that you rebel against the artists that come before you. That's as an artist. And so I felt that when I kept seeing modern art becoming less and less meaningful for me personally, although I love it, I missed history being included into art. So I thought I would obsessively paint Lincoln. And it wasn't a big, it's not a, I mean, I love it. So it's not even a, a matter of work. It, it's just what I love to do. And and I, I, these are two pieces I'm working on simultaneously. One's oil, one's acrylic, yeah. other way around. And um, I just love working really a contemporary piece with a representational piece at the same time. It's just, it's just great. And uh, yeah, no, so I've been painting Lincoln for a long time. And I, I brought some pictures of some paintings that yeah. are, I don't think people, a lot of people have seen them. They're kind of different and some have a fun backstory um, to them. Let me so pull up the first this. one here. Sure. There we go. This is, I, and also number my paintings, um, they never have titles, but this one is of my, um, you can see my little good luck charm. I just decided to paint this, this little guy one time. It's my little link, uh, metal Lincoln. And it's kind of a big canvas. It's now residing out in um, in Denver, but I so that this just shows that Lincoln can be painted in many ways, and I painted my good luck, my good luck charm. So that's all I have to say about that one. Sure. We move to the next one. I love this one. Yeah, this is a terrible picture, but the painting is nearly that hot. Um, but this is kind of fun because this was purchased by a, a, an actor out in Hollywood hmm. and I got to visit um, and he lives way up in the hills near uh, Mulholland Drive. And the cool thing is that his house was used for Quentin Tarantino's movie, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Hmm. And that uh, Tarantino saw that painting and then uh, called that room, the Lincoln Room. Uh, so that's my claim to fame with Hollywood in that painting. <laughs> and I, it was fun being out there to see it um, in, in, that, uh, in that house. It was fun. So that's the claim to fame to, to that painting. And that, that's a horrible picture of that painting. I can't find, I, I, I don't think I shot that one, which is a big mistake. It um, looks great to me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very hot. Really, that's very what, hot. What inspires you to sit down and say, this time I'm going to paint Lincoln this way versus, well, I, we have a couple more down the line that are extremely dramatically different. Is it your your personal mood at the time that you're feeling? Is it a new piece of scholarship you've read about Lincoln? Is it just a challenge that you've never painted him in a certain way before? How do you get inspired? I think it's all three, of those, all three of those things, Ashley. You know, I think about it all the time. I just think about it all the time. So when I get up, I get up and I start working at about three o'clock in the morning up here. Um, and I just, just dive right in. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. We go to the next one. Yeah, this one, this one is so very different from the one we yeah, just saw. Yeah, it's based on that painting. It's the second oldest Second painting, uh, based on the photos, uh, second photo of Lincoln. 
And I can never say the photographer's name. It's Schneidau or something. Maybe you can help me there, Harold. I know. Kali Karpus von Schneidau. Thank you. It's a great and, name. Yeah, and it's really ultra, it's very textured. The lines going across the beige lines are raised lines I used with a pastry um, you know, bag. And that painting is very large and it ended up out in Utah in an ultra modern high rise. And it had a dedicated wall. It was pretty cool. So that's the only reason that it was just a, it was it is with a modern painting or really a very modern painting, a contemporary painting in a very contemporary set, uh, setting. So I was really happy about that. Yeah, it was just really neat. And so your your paintings are more so inspired by obviously your individual take on Lincoln and, and you know, the three things that we just talked about. Um, but in terms of what Harold was talking about, where politics becomes so infused in the paintings, do you paint Lincoln with politics infused as well? Or do you kind of shy away from that? I do. I think I shy away from politics, but I certainly don't shy away from, I mean, I'm a sucker. I'm. A, it's, it's, he's a hero to me. Um, you know, he's the, he's the great, you know, I think Joshua Speed once said, or he kind of paraphrasing again, Harold, don't kill me for this paraphrasing, but I think he said that there was a naturalness about Lincoln that really came through. And I think that that's what is so attractive about him is, oh, he was so, he, you know, we would call him authentic now. Yeah. And even authentic politician. And I, and maybe that's naive. I, I'm, you know, you called me a scholar before, but I'm hardly, I'm just a, a beginner student. And, you know, I, I assume that his, he was authentic. What you saw is what, what you got. And right. that's what's so, attra so attractive about him as a, as a politician. Um, right. You know, there was, and, and so painting him, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's love too. You know, the guy is a genius, you know, yeah. you know I just never grow tired. And it could, just, I just, could I just say that, you know, the only person who painted Lincoln often and, repeatedly, and for as long as Wendy has, is Carpenter. But he basically retreaded, if that's a word, his Emancipation Lincoln. And as his as he grew from a young to an old man, and he lived um, really only till 70, but 1830 to 1900, but his power is clearly diminished. So and he dated everything 1864. So you have to be kind of, well, it doesn't take a lot of skill to see which ones were early and which ones were late. I think Wendy is the only painter who finds a new Lincoln every week. Yeah. And it's a tribute to both the fact that Lincoln is a man of a thousand moods and um, different kinds of inspirations, but that Wendy is not afraid to revise, reinterpret, and yeah. go past the work she did a year ago, yeah. which is what I find fascinating about her stuff. There's well, a, it's a great it's way to so fresh. It's a great way to put it, Harold, because I mean we talked about this all the time on Lincoln Fellowship in terms of the many, many, many ways that Lincoln is used, sometimes misused or abused in certain in instances, um, to fill all different kinds of purposes, political, cultural, religious, um, you know, gender, all of it. He serves, he means so many things, different things to different people. And I feel like, Wendy, that's that's what your artwork gets to, is that he had so many of these different sides that so many different people kind of picked up on. And then, of course, in the wake of his death, more and more people came to mythologize certain aspects of him. And then more and more people came to interpret him, you know, even with, with greater difference than before. But your your artistry captures that because Carol's right. It's every every week there's a new idea, probably every day, uh, knowing you. And then we get to have fun interpreting what Wendy yeah. is trying to convey. And she doesn't have to tell us whether we're right because it's exactly. all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, I see this picture as kind of illustrating the fact that we're applying our own colors to the canvas that is Lincoln. She's yeah. helping us to understand that he's, you know, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor um, image. Yeah, He will fit any need, um, I hope still. And that's how I see this picture. And look, I'm holding my arms this way. I'm inspired yeah. to be right. <laughs> self-confident, which I'm not. <laughs> Wendy, I'm going to go to your next one, if that's okay. Yeah, we, whatever your time allows. I know we're getting close. 
This next one also sticks with me just because I know that you're an observer of other people observing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This one, I this one was. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to show a kid looking at Lincoln. Um, that's all I. That's all I really wanted to do was somebody looking, especially a child looking at a painting of Lincoln. Um, not realistic, just kind of he's just kind of floating there looking at that. Yeah. That's all that. But it was a different take. Yeah. on it yeah that that painting had so much paint on it that i had to have it restretched the, for the people they were not happy with the way the painting was bow, bowing oh my gosh <laughs> it, yeah, it was nice i it, the restretching was really great they did a great job that must weigh a lot Wendy. it does it does Again, another big, pretty big canvas. And a lot of impasto there. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I have a Wendy canvas. I should have photographed it for this event. That is so spare and lean, it's mostly bare canvas. That's right. That's right. It's on my dining room wall here in the city. It does have a lot of bare canvas in it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's amazing. Yeah, this one is the one that's out in Utah now. I just did this on wood panel just bare wood panel. I glued the panel together and I, I went through a, a, a searching for Lincoln stage just about last year, a year before, you know, I apply house, that's just house paint. And then I apply Lincoln first house paint and then scrape away hoping that I hit Lincoln uh, mm -hmm. underneath just to show just, uh, you know, we're just still searching for Lincoln and, and want Lincoln, you know, mm -hmm. still around. Yeah. It's I very love stories about, I'm sorry. I, I just love stories about process. Yeah, not all artists talk about process. I love. I don't understand it. I don't know how she does it. I don't know how any artist does it. But right. it's so much fun to hear the process for me. Right, right, absolutely. Painting was, that painting is, was Boeing again, and I told the gentleman he wanted me to ship it out to Utah. He was in the gallery, and I said, "But it is Boeing. Um, do you want me to take some money off the painting?" He goes, "Oh no, no. I want it to bow. I love it, Boeing." I'm like. Oh. <laughs> That was his own interpretation that he wanted to yeah. preserve. Yeah. When I just showed my, I one of my one, favorites. This one's in the Gettysburg College um, fine, uh, collection, um, uh -huh. which I'm very honored by. Um, yeah, this is one of my favorites too. It's a pretty old painting, but I like it. Yeah. Yeah, and there's certainly yeah my the answer to my question about political influence and. You're right. I'm sorry. You corrected me. Yes. Well, it's about American loss and the what. What might have been about some crucial moments where we lost leaders who might have guided us in a different direction. Right, right, right. This one. That one I just wanted to include because it's a very large canvas and I painted it entirely with a broom. Huh, no yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, it was really fun. Um, and I think it turned out pretty good. I like the way it How, how big is it, Wendy? Uh, it's uh, at least it's over six feet, almost seven feet tall, maybe wow. five or six wide. Yeah, pretty big. Wow. I painted it on the floor. This is my shroud of Turin favor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's just yeah, just the the idea of you using a broom to do this or a you know yeah. a cake spatula or whatever, just to see what the textures look like. It's amazing. It's really yeah. Cool. It's it one of those chisel brooms, pretty big. I just went over to Giant and bought a broom. <laughs> if I could do it and use a big bucket of water. Huh. Amazing. That's interesting. Sorry, this is so clunky getting over to these. You know, what? You can, you know if we want to move on to, I know Harold wants to talk about the, uh, no, oh, I, love, I love this. Yeah. This is, I love this, this is the Gettysburg Address. Um, this is a very, this is a 48 by 48. Wow. Uh, Gettysburg Address. This one was bought by a Coast Guard couple. Um, a young man and woman came to the gallery and they had just gotten married and they wanted it for their wedding gift. So it's now residing in, uh, and actually I delivered it to them. Um, okay. It's the Gettysburg Address. And the last four uh, shall not perish from the earth is uh, I burned into witness wood right out here on Baltimore Street. No way. Uh, yeah, that, uh, the, the wood that, on the four, you know, the, the diamond uh, there. Um, yeah. But I, I wanted something abstract and yet cemented in 
the witness would sort of in his hand, I tried to copy his hand huh. as close as closely as I, I could. And in the bottom right corner is open, the only open-ended, um, you know, aside, I just kind of hoping that the future still holds the Gettysburg Address close. Uh, yeah. But it is the entire Gettysburg Address. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's really, really cool. Here, I'll move to the, um, the Lincoln Memorial one. So Harold asked me recently if I ever did the Lincoln Memorial, and I've done a lot of the Lincoln Memorial. I love doing the Lincoln Memorial because the working with white and tones of white are, is incredibly interesting. This is one of the first ones I did. That one's in Allentown now. Um, so yeah, that's one of the Lincoln Memorials. You can just breeze right through these Lincoln Memorials. And it's timely because as Ashley sets up the next one, May marks the centennial of the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial. And I dare say people will become interested again. Yeah. I'm the only writer who's written a biography of Daniel Chester French and an introduction to the work of Wendy Allen. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's really a great book. Yeah, I told Harold this past forum, I bought it again, the book again, because I keep loaning it out to people, and I said, this one I'm going to keep oh, for myself. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, this one's a, a very large canvas, again, but kind of finding Lincoln under the graffiti type of effect, um, putting the last best hope at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and again, Lincoln for me is just hope. Um, it, it makes, he makes me happy, hopeful. Um, and so that's the Lincoln Memorial underneath, underneath that piece. That's New Jersey right now. She knows where every picture is. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I think my baby's out there. You know? You're right. Yeah. That's right. I don't know how you left me there. Now this one I painted on the night of 9-11. Um, huh. the straw, like everybody, I went down and painted this while taking a break from the news and uh, just showing a kind of a shattered Lincoln Memorial. Huh. Yeah. Do you, um, you started it that night. You didn't finish I it the whole thing that night. Really? Oh my word. Wow. Yep. That's amazing. Did it go to someone um, with a connection to 9-11 or where well, is it? It was purchased right away. Um, I can't, I, uh, I can't remember her name who has it. Um, huh. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, it's about, it's about a 36 by 36, I think. Yeah. Well, as Harold was saying, that eventually with different representations of Lincoln in the 19th century, emotion and sentiment took over um, over truth. Um, but in a case like this, you have to wonder, is is the emotion really the truth um, in, in truth? Well put. Beautiful. Um, because mm -hmm. you capture it. You capture it beautifully. That's beautiful. Wendy, I'm curious, as an artist, what is the most difficult thing about painting Lincoln? You've got to get the face right. Even if you're doing an abstract piece, it just has to sit and feel right. Um, you know, I always start every painting of Lincoln, starting with the eyes. His eyes were beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and then those crazy lips, are they drive me to distraction. And um, his nose changes, his face changes. And I think you see that throughout all the books that Harold writes about how artists complain about the changing face. He yeah. does have a changing face. And uh, he's, you know, he's made up of shadows and light spots. And, yeah. But if you don't capture that empathetic look, if you don't capture that look that we all love about Lincoln, you know, you might as well just beep and toss it because that's what draws people to him is that beautiful face. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful face. Yeah. And Wendy's right. The, the more than one painter has said Lincoln's face was the despair, uh, the despair of every artist who ever painted him. Yeah. Not Wendy, but it, no, I'm not. Enjoy. Yes. Right. Uh, people who saw him. I mean, he was the interesting thing is that he was very much committed to not only posing for photographs, but in the very busy days in the White House, posing for artists, painters, and sculptors. He knew that that was the way to be remembered, not just um, in a documentary way, but in a heroic slash memorialized way. Yeah. So he, and, uh, you know, he didn't, he wasn't terribly cooperative, but he let them in. And then he said, you can watch me when I'm 
opening my mail. He he didn't just sit the way George Washington yeah. does in the opening of Adam Chernow's book. Yeah. He doesn't spend two hours each day yeah. like this. So it's hard. Right. We did have one question before we wrap up that I'd like to, to ask. Um, when did Volk's life mask first start to affect the sculpted images of Lincoln? Um, that's a great question. So um, I would say beginning with St. Gaudens in the 1880s, when uh, this whole New York circle, including Richard Watson Gilder, who was not the late Dick Gilder, but the original Richard Gilder, the newspaper, a magazine editor, commissioned a new bronze casting of the mask. Now it had had a life of its own as a collector's piece because Volk was brilliant commercially. He did his own busts and sold them. And he did the life mask as a separate piece. No one had ever really done that before in America anyway. Um, and um, But St. Gaudens and Gilder and those folks were the first to say, this is the model. This is the only model. Um, and um, uh, French, of course, used it. There it is. We all have one nearby. I use it all the time. For oh, yeah. I mean, uh, when Lincoln, when uh, Volk made his first statue of it, uh, Lincoln said, there is the animal himself. Hmm. So that's the way he described it. But um, um, I would say so beginning in the late 1880s, it became standard issue. And French used it for the Lincoln, Nebraska statue. Um, there was a, a copy of the mask in uh, Chesterwood, his studio, which has got a nail here and a nail here and nails here. And everyone who looks at it is horrified. Is it a stigmata? Is it right. somebody who doesn't like Lincoln? And the answer is he was taking measurements of the distance between different features and then magnifying them as he went from a, as French went from a six inch model to a 12 inch model, ultimately to a six foot model, expanding it through measurements. He was a very pragmatic and scientific sculptor. Interesting. And of course he didn't do the marble. People, um, you know, think that he was a Michelangelo who took a 60 foot block of marble and spent 50 years doing that. But in right. fact, he had these wonderful marble cutters named the Picciarilli brothers, um, Italian born stone cutters and marble cutters who worked in the Bronx, right near what later became Yankee Stadium. And he gave them the six foot model and they cut it, you know, they did 36 marble blocks. No one ever fit it together till they went to Washington. Sort of like one of Wendy's deconstructed, deconstructed his paintings. Right. Somehow it all worked. And, um, I hope Wendy does a few more Lincoln memorials before the big anniversary. Yeah, definitely going to, definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much, Harold. Thank you. I know you always have so much on your plate, especially you know this time of year at the holidays. And Wendy, thank you so much for, for joining us and contributing your, your expertise. I think this is a real treat to have both of you um, with different backgrounds, but of course a lot of overlap too in your studies of Lincoln. Uh, to, to talk about some of these big issues related to the image. Um, and I know it'll provide food for thought uh, for a bunch of the visitors. Well, thank you for being such a knowledgeable um, interlocutor. And I just want to apologize to everyone who's listening. I don't know what's going on, but I realize it must be very annoying. Well, it was weird because before when the three of us were talking before we signed on, it was fine. It was like it just started acting up. Yeah. Let's say bad dress rehearsal, good performance. So we have yeah. Well, now I can join in because I'm sure you all can hear the whining of two children uh, in the background. So it's been a symphony of beautiful noises tonight on the program. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ashley. Thank, Thank you, you, Harold. Thank you, Happy Wendy. Holidays. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for tuning in at various times throughout the year um, for our various conversations with Lincoln Scholars. We hope to continue this program in the future with um, a new array of scholars and a new array of topics. So we'll definitely keep you posted going forward. But thank you all and um, have a wonderful holiday season for everybody watching. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.